Welcome to the All About You podcast. My name is Sheila and I am your host. In this podcast, I invite people to tell their stories of their travels, hobbies and passions. These podcasts are also now available on my All About You YouTube channel. So if you have a story to tell, please contact me on allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and let's tell your story. Welcome to another conversation on the All About You podcast. And today I'm very happy to be sitting here with Liz and Neville from Australia. So welcome to the podcast. Thank, Thank you, you, Sheila. Go right back to the very beginning. Where were you living in Australia? Most recently, before we moved, we were living in Canberra, the capital. And life was good? Yes, life was good, but we'd had a long-held dream of living in Europe. Um, and we'd actually tried some years before, well not tried, we'd looked into moving to the UK. It would have, it would have been possible, but extremely difficult. Um, and, and then at one point, um, when I was living in Afghanistan, I had a Bulgarian housemate who had uh, excellent contacts at the Bulgarian embassy, and we considered moving to Bulgaria. So was there any particular reason you wanted to leave Australia? Yes. We didn't like it there. We were both born in Australia and okay. we'd, we'd lived in various parts. But I think we both had long held a dream of being somewhere else, experiencing something different to Australian culture. So when, when the opportunity arose, we were both keen to, mm. to, to take it. We didn't have strong family ties. We were both born and grew up and spent a lot of our life in Adelaide. But we'd moved, I'd lived in Sydney for a number of years. We'd both moved to Canberra 10 years before we moved to Europe. And so both sets of parents were dead. I've got one grown up son. Um, we weren't very close to our siblings. So we didn't have the strong family yeah, ties. Yeah, we, we were accustomed to being well separated from our family. Mm. So being a bit further away wasn't correct. Because that's the thing with Australia, it's not a two hour flight on no, EasyJet, oh, no. is it? I mean, it's a long journey if you need to yeah. get back. And I think that's often why particularly a lot of people in the UK favour Spain, because it is a two hour journey. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, it's, it's easy access back to England. I mean, Australia is a very long way away and internal flights are, are expensive. So it's, even if you do want to fly back to, to Adelaide from Canberra, it's a two and a half, three hour flight and yeah. it's, it costs a lot of money. So what was the reason you picked the UK to, as your first choice? I suppose, you know, part of the Commonwealth. Oh, in, and, and the tradition of, of connection between mm -hmm. Australia and the UK. Language. Um, I mean, we, we had travelled to the UK on holiday and we loved it. We, we still do like it very, very much. Mm -hmm. But I think all sorts of reasons we wouldn't have been happy there. The mm -hmm. weather probably predominant. So you looked at the UK, you looked at Bulgaria, and now you're in Spain. Mm. So how did the Spain thing come about? It's her fault. Ah, okay, over to you then, Liz. <laughs> I was, I basically conned my way onto a field trip to the north of Afghanistan with the project I was working on. And because I didn't really have a role on that trip, other than being a sticky beak, um, I spent a lot of time with the close protection officer. And he and I chatted about a number of things. Very nice man. He and his wife live in a village near... Seville, Ma near called Seville, Marchena. Marchena. Mm -hmm. And we were chatting about our desire to live in Europe. And he said, a bit of a throwaway line, really. Why don't you, why don't you try Spain? They'll take anyone, even Australians. And so <laughs> I can remember it was, it was summer and it was 50 degrees during the day. It was, even for an Australian, it was so, so hot. It was ridiculous. And I remember I was staying in this grotty, horrible guest house. And I can remember that, that night sitting there in my underwear with the air conditioner pelting as, as, as strongly as, as it could. And I, I Skyped Neville and said, do you fancy moving to Spain? Yeah, I'll be in, yeah. So he looked up the next, well, you take over now. Yeah, I, I looked up the embassy and went to visit the embassy to find out what the requirements were and what the possibilities were. And I went into the embassy and was, was talking to the woman there and I said, how many people have applied to migrate from Australia to, to Spain? And she said, none. She said, just a minute, I'll go and have a look. And she rang Sydney and she came back and she said, there was one and he was successful. So she was very pleased and 100% you know, success rate. So it wasn't going to be a problem. 100% success rate on one person? <laughs> one person. A helicopter wow. pilot. A helicopter pilot. Really? So, so something lots like of, really Lots useful. of similarities yeah, between yeah. us. And, yeah. Yeah. So 
what was the transition like once you sort of told your family and friends you were going were they supportive they what what are you thinking and some were very supportive and understanding quite a few friends sort of thought you know it's it's wonderful that you're living your dream quite a few also thought these people are crazy australia's the best place in the world why on earth would you want to leave and certainly my brother and and people with any with any sort of significant, unusual decision, which it was for them, people are, are very um, keen on giving you unsolicited opinion. You know, the, the what ifs came out. Yeah. Well, what if you don't like it? Well, we'll come back. Functional adults, we, we can rationalise this. You if can we don't work like, it round And it, yeah. yes, it will cost us a lot of money to go and, and know it was a mistake and to come back, but it's only money. So that's an interesting point, Liz. Do you think it's because people are thinking, oh my God, I would really love to do that. You know, I'm not that brave or I just haven't got the guts to do it. They're sort of trying to, well, have you thought about this and have you thought about that? Do you think a lot of people, I were, don't know. given the opportunity, they would like, yeah, I'd love to do it, but it's a bit complicated, a different language. And Most Australians, they love to travel. They love to travel and they are inveterate travellers. To want to move to another country in general, no. No, it, it, Australia is the best country in the world, and why doesn't the rest of the world know that? Unfortunately, we have strong immigration laws which stops the rest of the world from coming and ruining it for us. That's always one thing yes. that has intrigued me about Australia, because Australia is very much, these are the skills we need. If yes. you match the criteria, then we would love to have you. So they've really thought, okay, we're only going to let the people in yeah. we really need. I know at one time it was dentists, it was mm. midwives, that type oh, yeah. of thing, people for the construction industry. It was on a point system. So rather than just any Tom, Dick and Harry coming in, you actually had to benefit the country. Yes. And in return, you had a good lifestyle, you earned good money. So what about the actual physical side of, of moving, the packing? The organising, the form filling. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how did that all go? Well, right, Liz is handing over to well, Neville. The reason she's handing over to Neville is because <laughs> she was in Afghanistan, so she left it all to me. Right, okay, <laughs> so naturally it became your department, your project. Yeah, I, I, it wasn't that, that difficult really. I, once you'd made the decision, finding out the requirements was reasonably straightforward. Filling out the paperwork and that, that sort of thing was straightforward. I tried to determine what the tax implications and legal implications, but that turned out to be too difficult. So I thought, I'll worry about it when we get there. Probably the most difficult thing was organising our animals, because we had a, a cat and a dog at that stage, who'd travelled with us to Fiji and back, so we'd, we'd travelled with them before. But they had to have various vaccinations and Yeah, they and have to all the paperwork and, as well. And then organising the flight. And they, they were flying separately to me, so I had to organise a flight so that I'd be there to collect them. And that was probably the most difficult part of the logistics. The rest of it was, you know, put everything in a box, phone an international transport agency, and they organised it to deliver it wherever we were. So that was reasonably straightforward. Yeah, the animals were the, were the most difficult part. And at any part when you're physically dealing with the logistics and the packing and the form filling, was there at any point where you just sort of thought, hmm, are, are we actually doing the right thing? Was there any element of doubt at all? Or you were just, once you've made that decision, right, let's just do it? Not from my perspective. I look back now and think it was such a massive leap of faith. Well, I think fortunately when we were doing it, there weren't the social media pages mm. to ask advice. So I, if we were trying to do it now, there are so many social media pages which say you have to do this and you need that and you can't do these sorts of things. And there would have been so many impediments put in the way that we probably would have said, you know, it's all too hard, we won't bother. But I think being naive and just sort of saw it as a great adventure. And I think that's a very valid point, Neville, about social media because I belong to lots of groups and to me, some of the information that is being asked on Facebook, hang on a second, you need to get in touch with the school yourself, you need to yeah. get in touch with yeah. the health system or a bank. Don't rely on some Tom, Dick and Peggy on Facebook yeah. Mm -hmm. giving you mm -hmm. their story because every story is different. And particularly when it comes to like legal applications, you need to get it from that department, yeah. that office. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So I must admit, when I came to Spain, there wasn't the social media as yeah. well. 
And I'm glad, I agree with you 100%, mm. because when you look at this information, you think, this was a story for you, but mm. that is your story. It's not everybody's story, and you had a bad experience. Really interesting. So you were packing up a big house, a small house? We packed up a large townhouse, I guess you, mm -hmm. you would call it. Yeah. But, I mean, I was, as Neville said, I was working. But having said that, we'd only just returned about 18 months earlier from Fiji. So we'd packed up the house prior to that, and most of that was already in storage. We'd been in Fiji, we came back, and we still probably hadn't really fully unpacked mm. from mm. that trip. So there was less junk and stuff yeah. to get rid of. So you didn't have to do one of these massive house Not declutters really. of... been through that. And we'd done a lot of that when we moved back from Fiji to a, a house that we bought off, the townhouse we bought off plan when we were in Fiji. I, I remember the, the, the kitchen island was about, I don't know, five metres long and it was covered with glasses. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd done all that sort of chucking out and then before we go, you gave away some rugs and some... Yeah, we gave away a lot of before furniture and things. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk about you coming to Spain. What was one of the first sort of, oh my God, culture shocks of living in Spain? I mean, had you been learning Spanish? No, 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 no okay. neither of us had been to Spain. I, Liz had been there when she was 21. But I, okay, so you had no I'd, experience? I'd never been to Spain. Okay. I mean, the only Spanish we spoke was you know, from, from the movies, like Oh, Us, right, Us yeah, Lister. that you picked yeah, up Arnie. A, Arnold Schwarzenegger, that was about it. So. <laughs> well, we had to come here um, to apply for the residency, mm -hmm. which had to be applied for in Australia. Oh, yeah, that's... We had to come here um, and, and set that, things up. Yeah, part of the requirements for obtaining a visa was that we had a place to live. Uh, fortunately, we we sort of organised a trip to England mm. uh, that Christmas, so we sort of changed plans slightly, came to Spain and organised, even though it was probably illegal because we didn't have an NIE and that sort of thing, but uh, we had an accommodating real estate person who uh, helped us obtain a, uh, a rental mm. property. So we had a, an address which was critical to, uh, yeah. to obtaining a visa. So what were some of the culture shocks you had when you came to Spain? Well, don't, don't forget, I'd been in Afghanistan, so it, that was more of a culture shock than, than coming to a civilised European country. Mm. Um, we were in Seville for two weeks to, to do all that. Um, I mean, it wasn't just the rental. It was, there was other health insurance we had to get. Um, and, of course, being Christmas, New Year, um, and not having any language yeah. skills, it took longer than it otherwise might have. I don't recall any. I mean, the biggest shock, I suppose, has been the bureaucracy. Um, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. masters, absolute masters of bureaucracy. Uh, but initially, I, not no. having any language skills, uh, just trying to survive and obtain things like finishing the visa process yeah. and that sort of thing, mm. without any language skills. It was, yeah. it was I mean, I think difficult. particularly for people moving from Europe like myself, it wasn't that difficult. <laughs> no. If you're moving from the States, Canada, or anywhere out of Europe, it's it's a huge difference now. Yeah. And even after Brexit, now for the Brits, it's a lot of hoop jumping well, and yeah, red tape. Oh, yeah. oh, but yeah. I think one of the things in Spain, A, is getting a list of all the paperwork you need. That's the first hurdle. The second one is presenting it, getting the appointment, presenting it at your local town hall is the next problem. And then, trust me, there'll always be one vital oh, bit always, of paper always, that yeah. wasn't on the list, yet they need. Yes. Once you've got all that paperwork, it is purely a rubber stamp at your local town hall, and you are in, basically. But it's getting that list, then getting, and the paperwork's got mm. within three months of today's yeah, yeah, date. Yeah. yeah, that creates all sorts of problems for us, because like, we need birth certificates and marriage certificates and that sort of thing. So we can order them online. But then they take several weeks to arrive from Australia. Oh, pigeon post, yeah. Then we have to send it to Madrid to be a postille mm -hmm. and then bring it back and have it translated. So once you finish that process, there's not a lot left of the three months to, to lodge your paperwork. Yeah. I mean, one thing about Spain, though, everything is very, very local. Your local town hall, which nine times out of yeah, ten is within walking it, distance. For us, when we were in uh, uh, Puente, there wasn't any local to, to obtain our visas. Right. I had to go, initially I had to go to Seville for the first one. After that, I had to go down to Malaga to the Oficina de Estranjeros there. And that and that was a, a trauma because they only saw 50 people a day. So yeah. you had to get there hours before they opened. So I, I would go down at three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. So I was in the, uh, in the first 50 in the queue because the queue was... Mm. 
Yeah. Mm. Rinse yeah. it off. Yeah, I must admit that is a very Spanish thing, isn't it? Everybody just queues up and whoever's at the front yeah. of the queue and gets those 20 days appointments you're in. So let's talk about then you're living in Spain. You've been here for a little while. Is there anything you miss from Australia? Apart from a few people, the only thing I do slightly miss, but it's not a not a big deal, is variety of food that you can get yes. in the restaurants and, and in the supermarkets. But, I mean, we love Thai food, Indian food. Um, I mean, you can get Mexican, Thai, Indian, Italian, Greek in any city or suburb of any city. You can get all of that. And takeaway. And takeaway. Home <laughs> delivery. Oh. Um, Are you a big home delivery fan? Well, no, but it's not, it's nice to do it occasionally. Right. And And being in a, a small village, there's no such thing. And if, yeah. if, if you, we may be able to organise a, a pizza, but they don't start cooking the pizza until nine o'clock. So that that was perhaps a little difficult to get used to. Yeah. But, but apart uh, from that, no, yeah. no, absolutely nothing. Yeah. Right. I, fortunately, I, I'm a reasonable cook, so I can cook anything we, we want. The trouble is getting the ingredients, specific ingredients together. And they're usually odd things like mixed peel. I, mean, yeah. I, I can't find mixed peel. Real currants, the English, yeah. English style of currants are just impossible to get in Spain. That is also interesting because it's not until you want to do, you know, make something for specific, Christmas or something yeah. for Easter and you just kind of think, okay, well, ha what can I substitute for this? So, yeah, that's very yeah. true. Well, I, I make hot cross buns. I've, I've taken to making my own mixed peel to make hot cross buns. So let's talk about meal times because Australia, you do eat quite early in the day, sort of your lunch and dinner. Um, it's probably similar to the UK. Similar to the UK. Um, yeah. We still have more Australian meal times. I mean, we have lunch at home at 12.30. Um, we have dinner at 7, uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock, depending on whether it's winter. Neville's in charge of the cooking. Uh, so we do eat Mm. very much differently at different times to, to the Spanish. Yeah, because I think that's a very large learning curve for British mm. people is how late the Spanish eat. Yeah. I mean, lunch is at 2 o'clock. Dinner could be anywhere from 9.30, 10 o'clock. You wouldn't even think of going to a restaurant until 9. Oh, yeah. And then the chef probably won't turn up to at least half past 9 and then he starts turning on his ovens and things. So, yeah, that, that's a huge part of it. Let's talk about some of the pros of living here. What some of the things you think, oh, my God, this is just so good. Siesta, Neville, is a siesta a good idea? It's, it's not something I've really taken part in, you know, but I, it's, it's somewhat frustrating occasionally because, you know, I'm used to being able to go out in the afternoon and do shopping and go to the, fer the ferreteria and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Uh, in Australia, here, it'll be closed. But you know, it's just a matter of adjusting when you go out to buy things. And yeah. Sunday trading doesn't Sunday really trading. exist here other no. than bars and restaurants. Yeah. I mean, one of the positives is their respect for, for age. In Australia and in the UK, once you pass sort of middle age, you, you become invisible. But here, you're treated with so much respect. Yeah. Uh, you go into a shop and they give you priority for things because you, you're older. It yeah. doesn't happen in Australia. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the things here as well. It's like at lunchtime, as you say, shops are closed. Mm. And particularly in the summer, a whole restaurant will shut for the whole of July or the whole yeah. of August. Yeah. A shop will close for the whole month because that's when everybody takes their holidays. Off they go. And... Don't think of buying something in August yeah. or getting something delivered. Yeah, it's yeah. just not going to yeah. happen. Well, don't yeah. get sick in August. All the doctors have been on holiday. And it was an interesting conversation the other day with somebody. You can go to the bank. You can go to the doctors. Your appointment says 10 o'clock. You get there 5 to 10, sitting there. All the doctors troop out in their white coats, their stethoscopes, and they're going to have their breakfast. Yeah. And the same in the bank. And you just sit there for half an hour yeah. and they come back, right, okay, if you'd like to come in. Yeah, yeah. in England that would never happen. Oh, no, no, yes, and, right. and I think in a lot of countries, but here it's like, yeah, yeah. that's totally normal. Yeah. The doctor's got to go yeah, and have his do. coffee the, the with his brandy. The general population are just very accepting of it. Yeah. It's a bit like driving into some of the, well, villages, but also some of the slightly larger cities like Antikera. You drive in and someone will stop in the, in the middle of the road to have a conversation with the person on the footpath. And yeah. people just pull up and wait behind you. I, th I think one of the things is here is time just works on a completely different span to everywhere else. Yeah. You go into a shop and you'll often find butchers, delicatessens, there are chairs because accepted you're going to sit and have a chat because yeah. you've bumped into yeah. your neighbour in, in the shop and yeah. that's accepted. Everything is a social, social outing. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not 
going to do one thing. It's going out to meet people and mm. have a chat. You stand in the supermarket at the checkout and yeah. wait for people to have a chat. And I do think once you get outside the main cities, there's tiny little shops and they've. it's a bit like going back probably sort of 50 years that's, in the that's, UK. That's what struck me when we arrived. Coming here was like as, as Australia was when, when we were children. Yeah. It, it has that sort of family feel, sort of freedom of the children mm. running around the streets and you know, everybody looking out for everybody else, mm. which, which has disappeared from Australian society. Yeah. I mean, I think I've learnt living here why they say the Mediterranean diet is the best because, okay, we look at the healthy food, you know, they start with a plate of salad um, and then they eat a lot of fish and vegetables, but they take time to go for a coffee, like the doctor's yeah. going out for half an hour. It's accepted in a lot of offices. They close at lunchtime. In theory, you go home and you'll have a lunch and you'll have a siesta and you come back. Mm. You start again at 5.30. So the country is really geared up for time for eating, mm. time for having a coffee, time for having a rest. And as you say, Liz, on a Sunday, family time, you're not in the latest you know, big department store or retail park. A lot of differences mm, mm, between mm. particularly the UK and, as you say, mm. from Australia. Mm. Do you think Spain will be your home? Oh, absolutely. Well, I've I've taken out Spanish citizenship, so we've so committed. you really have put your yeah nail yeah. on the wall. Well, our, our, our original decision, because we brought our dog and cat with us, our original decision was to stay until they they passed away, because we would, wouldn't want to put them through the, the trip of taking it back. And that was about took about five years, but by then we we decided this is where we wanted to stay. There's never been any doubt. We accepted the biggest risk was if one of us liked it here and the other didn't and felt strongly enough that a compromise couldn't be reached. But that hasn't happened. It probably wasn't very likely to, to happen. We've never disagreed on anything significant in a number of years. Neville was very happy to retire and I was very happy to keep working. And that's not always the case with every couple. I'm well aware of that, but I was very happy working uh, until fairly recently, and I probably still would be, but you know, the pandemic yeah. has put a stop to that. And, and he, you're very happy spending a lot of time on your own. Yeah. And because we've been together quite a long time and we're very established before I started working internationally and spending, we started spending a lot of time apart, we didn't face the challenges. We were very secure uh, in yeah. the relationship. Um, there was trust on both sides, uh, and we both have loved it here. Absolutely, it's the best thing that we've ever done, without question. That's my opinion, anyway. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Neville, do you want to have the last word? <laughs> I'm looking forward to the end of the pandemic, where we can start travelling around. And that was, a, that was another reason that we, we came. Right? Travelling from Australia is, just takes so long. We look forward to the idea of being able to go for a weekend of Amsterdam and travel around Europe. I, I love living in Europe. I don't yeah. think I, I think I was meant to live in Europe. I really wow. do. Brilliant. So, Neville, final word then, or are you going to leave it to Liz? No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liz and Neville, thank you so much for sharing your experience on the All About You podcast. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please subscribe on whatever platform you are using. It is free, and if you would like to tell your story please contact me on allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and let's tell your story.